auntie. So I should not take uh, credit for it. Um, I will be discussing today RRT in ICU. I just wanted to broaden it a little. And there will be some repetition from what we discussed last time as we will not be able to totally move away from AKI discussion. I will start off with discussing a particular patient we saw some time ago. This is a 38 year old male, farmer by occupation. He presented to a private hospital around 500 kilometers from here. And for four months or so, he had some swelling, but he had not taken any consultation. When he presented to the hospital there, around seven days, he had some pain abdomen. And in the last two days, he was having increasing breathing difficulty. He had diabetes two years prior to this presentation, otherwise absolutely healthy. He was tachypneic, tachycardic, hypoxic when he came to us. And the lab investigations done in the primary unit where he presented was 1.7. We do not have a baseline creatinine as we generally don't have most of the patients who come to us. He also had some metabolic acidosis there in Vijayawada. His complete blood picture, electrolyte, liver functions were normal. So because of the pain abdomen and the breathlessness, some metabolic acidosis, creatinine going up, the team there thought of an acute pancreatitis. So he was subjected to a contrast enhanced CT scan. It was normal. He was started on diuretics and as his breathing difficulty increased, he was referred to us. So probably by the time we saw him, there was acute kidney injury, primary, whatever the cause, plus the contrast that the patient had got. So when he came to our emergency room, he was awake, alert, he was tachypneic, tachycardic. Blood pressures were on the lower side, 80 by 40. Heart rate was around 120, respiratory rate as 30. He had crepitations, bilateral lung fields, oxygen saturation being 84% on room air. He was anemic, he was also ectric and grossly volume overloaded. So whenever you see a patient with minimal edema in the ER or ICU, please know that the person must be already positive fluid-wise at least by three liters or so. So if a nephrologist can elicit edema, this is by pressing on the shin, even a minimal edema, it already tells you that the person is grossly fluid overloaded. If the person is having significant edema, then it could be even 10 liters or so. Many times in the ICU, I believe one of the common mistakes we do, we do not estimate the total volume that is there inside the person. And this directly affects the outcomes, both short-term outcomes and also long-term outcomes. He did not have any cyanosis, clubbing and lymphadenopathy. His output was less than 20 ml for two hours in the ER. His blood picture showed WBC count was okay, platelet count was okay, normocytic, normoclomic picture. So as I already informed, he was a diabetic, sugar 2 plus. There was also some protein in the urine. In acute situations, we, were, we may not be sure how much importance to give to this. Obviously, there was no urinary infection. Creatinine by the time we got our labs was 4.2 with electrolyte being okay and there was severe metabolic acidosis. With this, we made a tentative diagnosis of multi-organ involvement. Albumin was low, bilirubin was elevated, SGOT, SGPT were also on the higher side. Tachycardia was significant. Echo showed RARV dilatation with significant PAH, but the ejection fraction was all right. Ultrasound showed normal kidneys and X-ray showed congested lung fields. COVID was negative. The provisional diagnosis, as I told you, was multifactorial AKI, secondary to contrast, drug-induced, and also cardiorenal as he had a right heart failure. Cardiogenic shock was there and background of diabetes mellitus. 
this was the treatment given i will not spend too much time on this but he was covered for sepsis and stress dose of steroids and right heart failure so some thiamine was given um with vasopressors in the icu we did not get consent for intubation as he was continuing to be hypoxic we offered him renal replacement therapy so we come to what is the renal replacement therapy that you would offer to this patient most of our crrt in our country at least is limited to starting quite late because one the hospital will not allow you to start unless they have deposited a particular amount in the unit that i work presently they have to deposit a lakh of rupees for starting crrt anyhow we didn't get consent for crrt so in those patients in whom we have acute presentation we are unable to do crrt we are reasonably okay to try a session of hemodia filtration we should be able to discuss this in detail another day but anyhow we try to do a hdf of 8 hours with these blood flows and replacement fluid hdf is hemodia filtration as i told you so there is a combination of convective clearance and a diffusive clearance in a prescription of hdf so patient did not tolerate continued to have worsening hemodynamics and increasing level of vasopressors we go back to the family got a consent for crrt and we started cvv hdf let me spend a few minutes here so whenever you prescribe crrt in the unit that you are in it is always good to have a default prescription many times in the middle of the night 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock you have to start the crrt the nurse will call you or the technician will call you so when you stay start crrt it's better to have a default prescription they can start off without waiting for too long and blood flows dialysate flows replacement everything can be a standard default prescription once you see the patient next day you can tweak the prescription based on what the changes have happened in the patient's metabolism or the reports hemodynamics by next day morning so the first thing that you would want to prescribe is the modality of crrt crrt has several things in the uh, flyer that dr tapesh sent he did mention cavh so that was the original type of crrt that was introduced by kramer and quite early we have moved away but some of us like me have been exposed to cavh also in our early careers so the modality here was cvv hdf which is continuous venovenous hemodia filtration the machine you should know a details about the machine blood flow the default prescription always will be 100 ml per minute which you can adjust and increase once 4 hours or so elapsed and the patient is more stable dialysate flow typically we want around 1000 ml the replacement fluid will be another 1000 ml and in this you may have to specify how much you want pre filter and how much you want post filter so when i say pre filter we are talking of the dialyzer which is there in the circuit you can add the replacement fluid before the filter what this does is it dilutes the blood in other words it dilutes the solute which you want to remove you want to remove urea it dilutes the urea so your clearance will obviously come down so many of us want to avoid pre filter replacement fluid but if you do not use pre filter replacement fluid you have thick blood therefore clotting risk will increase your filter life will come down therefore you may want to use a combination of pre filter fluid and also post filter fluid next you go on to how much of fluid you want to remove from the patient in an hour most often the default prescription will be keep in balance when i say keep in balance what i am trying to tell is you want to remove even 1 ml that is going into the patient during that hour if the patient is getting 100 ml including nutrition blood transfusion vasopressor antibiotic 
that 100 ml has to come out of the patient. Therefore, when you write a fluid order, you are talking of a keep in balance as a default prescription. That means everything that goes into the patient in that hour will be removed. Finally, you want to write what is the anticoagulation. This particular patient, we kept him on nil heparin when we started the CRRT. So as the patient was receiving systemic heparin, anticoagulation was not considered and we did not add anything to the circuit. But you should know many units across the world now have moved away from heparin and they use citrate and we could have a full class on citrate anticoagulation. We have developed our own protocol which we are using in several of our patients. The patient's cultures were not positive. Subsequently, we wanted to rule out thromboembolism because of RARV dilatation. And he was on CRRT and CT scan was done to rule out pulmonary thromboembolism. His blood pressure stabilized over a period of time. He was removed from NIV, never got ventilated. And he came off CRRT after 48 to 72 hours. After this, we had to continue him on HDF which we had tried initially on a daily basis. However, his platelet count started dropping. Initially, we thought because he was getting systemic heparin for suspected pulmonary thromboembolism, he uh, could have had hit positive, but the antibodies were negative. Anyhow, we had stopped anticoagulation by that time. Patient improved further and we ruled out pulmonary thromboembolism. Subsequently, we had asked for an autoimmune workup, which came as strongly positive ANA, anti-DSDNA, and anti-Smith antibodies. So to conclude, this patient had an autoimmune multi-organ involvement, probably going on for several months before he presented to us, but came to us with advanced heart failure, renal failure, and also multiple other organ involvement, including liver involvement. He was given pulse methyl prednisolone for three consecutive days, one gram each. By then we had got all cultures were negative and his urine output, which was close to anuria, as you saw, he, worked, he had less than 20 ml per hour, now started improving. And by end of four weeks, this patient was off dialysis, serum creatinine back to 0.7, platelet count 1.8, but even to this day, this patient is on oral steroids 0.5 mg per kg and also mycophenolate sodium. So this is one case scenario I wanted to discuss. Multi-organ failure, started on a modality, went on CRRT subsequently, came back on HDF and then improved or recovered from acute kidney injury. The second patient, very briefly, I will mention a 44-year-old male whose father was on dialysis and he was having a routine checkup with us. So we knew his GFR was more than 90 ml per hour, sorry, per minute, and he had no protein loss. Six months later, came to our emergency room with multiple stab injuries and gunshot wounds, shock, almost pulse and BP not recordable multiple inotropes, and he went on CVVHDF. I will not discuss the prescription as we just spent some time on it. 14 days later, he came off CRRT, went on SLED, discharged 33 days after admission, and discharge creatinine was 1.7. Even after two years, he continues to have a creatinine of 1.7, whereas his baseline was 0.7 or 0.8. With protein loss, Later, latest being 3.3 grams. So second case scenario, you saw somebody who had absolutely normal kidney, had a trauma or a gunshot wound and stab injuries, went on CRRT, acute shutdown, recovered to a level where we can call as CKD stage two or stage three, never came back to normal renal functions. So let me change the uh, scenario Look at what we know, know now as SEEK study, screening for early evaluation of kidney disease. It says the CKD prevalence in our country is close to 17.1%.
that means out of every 100 people in our country 17 have kidney disease and we had done as part of the care for your kidney foundation in the last seven years or so some studies in the hyderabad slums every wednesday we used to go to one of the slum area and look at the prevalence of ckd in these areas and we found that it was close to 14.8 percent or so and the commonest cause of ckd was diabetic nephropathy followed by chronic interstitial nephritis chronic glomerular nephritis cystic diseases stone disease and hypertensive disease but i want to take your um, focus to the last one what we understand today is there is an amount of aki in our community which does not totally recover in fact majority of our aki will enter into some form of chronic kidney disease so let us look at our own data we published in uh, nature's some time ago this was in 2010 or so contrastic characteristics between aki developed and developing world and we had given a list of things that were very different in the community when it comes to aki between the developed world and developing world but when it comes to icus it was very similar to the west the aki that you and i see in the icu is very similar to what the west sees except for the fact that we get our mean age of patients of AKI in the ICU is much less. I am now taking you through a paper which is from Akin. We were one of the units contributing to this uh, data. The prospective international multicenter study of AKI in ICU, 6,647 patients were screened and 1,000 were, 1,038 were enrolled. I want you to take you to the differences between the emerging and the developed world. We had a lot more interstitial nephritis, a lot more uh, glomerular nephritis, and also contrast-induced AKI compared to the developed world. But the less severity scores of illness and also sepsis was lesser in the emerging countries. But what we found was when you started RRT, in the emerging world, you waited and waited till patient developed significant azotemia, creatinine of a particular level or so. Whereas the Western world or the developed world started for reasons like acidosis, hyperkalemia, and they did not wait till the patients developed uh, significant azotemia and high creatinine. So the p-value was 0 0.01, telling us that the indications for dialysis were different in the developing world and emerging world, and we probably started dialysis much later. So if you look at the modality, the red bar is the emerging world, and we had multimodal, for example, you saw two patients in whom you started off with one type of dialysis, switched over to another type, switched back to that type again, and then discharged the patient. Unfortunately, you see the PD is quite less, though there is data to support that acute kidney injury recovers faster with peritoneal dialysis. So multimodal was more common in the developing world. And when you look at the outcomes, crude hospital mortality in the emerging world was 27.6% whereas it was 17.6% in those who had AKI in the developed world. Recovery of renal function, this is at the time of discharge, was 71% in the developed world, whereas it was 50% in the emerging world. Similarly, the dialysis dependence was much higher in the emerging world. This leads us to ask, what is it that we are not doing properly, which is making our patients to be dialysis dependent, not recovering their renal functions and increasing the hospital mortality when they leave the ICUs or the hospital. So one of the things that we need to understand is about the recovery of AKI. As I already shared with you, AKI does not recover or seldom recovers. Most of them enter into some form of CKD and also develop some amount of other organ involvement, for example, cardiovascular morbidity, mortality, new onset stroke, infections, which are much more common, even after two years after getting discharged, these patients have more infections, more fractures, 
more anemia and also even 2 years after getting discharge they do have more mortality so keeping this in mind a single episode of aki now we understand becomes a multi organ involvement and chronic organ involvement leading to poor outcomes in these patients so this you must have seen during our last lecture we have the natural history of aki this is from international society of nephrology which talks of some of the patients going on to permanent dialysis with a single insult whereas majority of the patients will go on to some form of ckd and these people who have had a ckd will develop subsequent aki and they are more prone for this aki so if you look at the model these aki patients have an insult drop their gfr recover partially have another insult go on to ckd developing ckd subsequently and we now know the disease modifiers of which cause from aki to ckd is the severity of aki number of episodes and also the duration of aki the longer the aki the more chances that ckd develops in these people so we also know today when you have a normal kidney tissue and when you have an aki the recovery is not complete and there is a chronicity setting in very early because of three different mechanisms one of them is known as nephron loss second is inflammation as part of it and the third is rarefication or vascular rarefication which leads to hypoxia of the adjacent normal tissue i will not have time to go through these things but both experimentally and in human we have data now to support mal adaptive repair mechanisms which make your aki to go on to ckd so one of the things that is supposed to affect this transition from aki to ckd is what you do for your patients in the icu if you choose a modality which is more bio compatible like crrt compared to a regular hd you may have more recovery of the renal functions that is the reason we are discussing these so short term outcomes are affected long term outcomes again are affected depending on what caused the aki what severity was the aki that is what stage and how long the aki persisted so nowadays in our icus we have patients who are having these type of supports which are now this patient is on crrt he came to us walking to the hospital after a toxic fume inhalation subsequently went on ventilator had a arrest went on polymyxin for sepsis he is also on ecmo if you can see on the right side so this patient is on multiple supports ventilator inotropes ecmo crrt and sepsis filter also keeping these type of complex patients you will expect that they will enter into ckd when they get out of the hospital fortunately this patient on crrt got discharged and subsequently uh, went back to normal life this is a, another patient who was on uh, post cabg who had peritoneal dialysis had aki peritoneal dialysis went back to near normal kidney functions after 4 to 6 weeks or so so when you look at aki today it is equally important to look at when you are diagnosing the aki apart from the fact that what you are doing to these people in the icus so the conceptual model we generally pick up aki after there is established drop in the gfr whereas the aim nowadays is to pick them up much earlier without looking at the serum creatinine so i got this cartoon to drive home the point when you look at a creatinine of 1.5 raise you are looking at 37 drop in gfr so you have a 37% decrease in gfr causing a small change of 1 to 2 creatinine raise so keeping this in mind when you look at creatinine probably you are looking at very late because especially in acute situations your creatinine generation rate is not stable your volume of distribution changes therefore you are underestimating the gfr 
there is tubular secretion of creatinine therefore you are underestimating the aki so so many things which are confounding your serum creatinine but that is what we are using to pick up aki so is there any other row, any other thing that you need to do before we say that this patient has aki we may be missing it for up to 72 hours so quickly i'll mention the adqi on biomarkers talked of looking at this uh, picking up of AKI much faster than what we normally pick up. So this is a paper from Kidney International. And subsequently, there were two more papers in contributions to nephrology. I had the honor of being part of this ADQI and all three papers. We learned a lot of how to use these biomarkers. I thought we should learn to use biomarkers in our country also, especially with the background that you saw in our ICUs there is more dialysis dependence when AKI is discharged. There is more uh, non-recovery of AKI in subsequent and contributing to CKD in the population. So when you look at biomarker being added to your own uh, KDGO criteria, you have KDGO criteria of creatinine or GFR and urine output on one side, and then you look at biomarker being positive or negative. Once you add biomarker, the outcomes of picking up early, intervening early, and probably CKD incidence will come down. There is data which we will not be able to discuss, but there is some Indian data also talking about this. So we are looking at biomarkers now, which may be markers of glomerular function, inflammation and repair, tubular damage, and also cell stress. So we can have another class on them, but whenever you use them, the aim is to diagnose early, prognosticate, and then prevent pre, uh, later outcomes like CKD. So when you have a biomarker along with your other diagnostic criteria, like functional markers like creatinine and urine output, you use this two by two matrix to make a early diagnosis. You may have a patient who has got only creatinine up, but no biomarker up, which means that there is a functional change, but there is no damage to the kidney, which means that patient probably has pre-renal failure, or you may have only damage biomarker has gone up, but there is no change in the function, which means that it's a very early AKI. If you intervene early, you can delay the other outcomes. So we understand a little more about AKI today. Now it is time for us to look at it closely and look at the modality of dialysis so that the outcomes are again good. So if you look at management of AKI today, you are picking it up very, very late as this cartoon shows you. You are looking at after the third stage, that is GFR decrease and established AKI. Whereas if you look at patients who are at risk and pick it up earlier, probably our outcomes of long-term CKD will improve. So let us go back to our RRT discussion. And presently, if you look at RRT practice in AKI, you look at timing, there is no consensus, though there have been some recent articles, including START AKI, which said there is no benefit of starting it very, very early. Com compared to the West, as I showed you some data, probably we are not starting very early. Our protocols don't allow us to start early and we are quite late in initiation. One of the reason our dialysis dependence is more. When it comes to access, there is consensus about which, which site and what type of access. When it comes to modality, there is no consensus again whether you should have a diffusive modality or a convective modality. CRRT, we have now some understanding that there is a default prescription wherein you should have a minimum dose. You cannot go below that, but there is no point in achieving very high doses or clearances also. Anticoagulation, I already mentioned, most of the centers in the world now talk or vouch by citrate, and we are still using heparin and some of us are using citrate also. When it comes to weaning from RRT, again, there is no consensus. Many of us believe as the urine output increases day to day, we should be able to wean off these patients. So we can discuss RRT under these headings, timing, access, modality, dose, anticoagulation, weaning. But for today's uh, discussion, we can just ask a couple of questions. When should we start it? What is the most appropriate therapy? and which modality should we start and then transition from one to another? And then when do we liberate our patients from RRT? Is there any strong data? 
we could stop here to take questions or discuss or we can go on talking dr tapesh you can decide because i thought with this background we can have some discussion no please go on sir very very nice um anybody and i thought with uh, whatever we discussed we can take some discussion then i can go on to answer these questions uh, one question would be sir like last time also you had mentioned that the dosing of antibiotics <coughs> For that, we need to actually understand the PKPD and not actually go by any nomograms or formulae. So, would you like to tell us, sir, something about, for example, if you have to dose meropenem, how would we go about it? The patient on RRT. Yeah. So, I have some uh, slides on that. Um, yeah. When you are doing a CRRT, how do you look at yes. how much of it? So, if there is no other thing so far, what we have discussed, so. Yeah. So whenever you look at AKI now, you look at this 5R approach, which we mentioned last time, risk assessment, recognition, response, renal support and rehabilitation. We will go on to uh, renal support. All these are published as part of our ad key from Hyderabad. So when you look at renal support, as we discussed, we have a little difference between what we uh, do in the West and what we do in the existing centers of the emerging world. So what we urged everybody now to look at is, look at the demand versus capacity. If your patient is having a very good urine output, you can always delay the di dialysis. If your patient's output is not good, you start early, but don't wait for them to develop complications like 150 urea or creatinine of six or potassium of six or very severe acidosis. Before they develop it, if you can start, probably our outcomes are better. So when you look at this, you can categorize the patients into high demand, normal capacity, high demand, low capacity, normal demand, low capacity. So if somebody has very high demand and low capacity, you start a dialytic support much earlier than you would want to wait. But somebody has normal capacity and low demand, you don't want to dialyze these patients. So keeping this paradigm in view, what you need to give for the patient in the 24 hours, vis-a-vis -vis what output that the patient is having, you will have to take into consideration the transfusions, the nutritional requirements, all of them also for the patient. So in order not to delay RRT, you have to look at more and more how much is the patient in the last 24 hours made a urine output, or there are some of us who look at what is called as definition of catabolic state. You look at the delta change in creatinine, potassium, phosphorus, acidosis, and then you can take a call about whether the patient is hypercatabolic or not. If these things are higher, you can decide that the patient needs to have RRT, have to get more uh, infusions, also nutrition, therefore better to subject the patient to earlier RRT. So when you have a clinical scenario, which we discussed now, two different scenarios, you can have what is the first option, second and third option. And the indication for which you are using. You may want to use a dialytic modality, life-threatening reasons like potassium being high or acidosis. In that case, your intermittent hemodialysis has the maximum clearance of close to 150 ml per minute. So it means that 150 ml of blood is cleared of urea in one minute. So when you have life-threatening indication like hyperkalemia, you will choose intermittent hemodialysis. Your main reason for starting RRT is fluid overload. You would want to choose a continuous modality or a prolonged intermittent modality. When you have hemodynamic instability in the patient, you again want to choose a continuous modality so that you don't contribute to the hemodynamic instability. When there is a brain injury, you would want to choose a continuous modality because the intracranial pressures changing are bad for the outcome. When somebody is hypercatabolic, again, I discussed with you, definition of hypercatabolic will be delta change in urea, creatinine, potassium, phosphorus. You would want to choose something with more clearance. And then as the patient improves, you may change from one modality to another modality. So this also we published that you can start a patient with IHD, switch over to prolonged intermittent, and then to CRRT, depending on how the patient is doing on that particular day. So what we now call as 
precision CRRT or precision RRT in the ICU. So you can, and this was addressed by a particular ad key called 17th ad key, which was conducted in uh, Asiago, Italy. What we looked at was, these were the faculty which attended. What we looked at was solute, solute control in CRRT. And we brought out this cartoon talking, you always start a default prescription for your patients in the ICU. The default prescription I already shared with you can have the modality, which is default, blood flow, which is default, dialysis flow, which is default. Subsequently, next day or the third day, you see that the pa patient's solute need has changed. Patient has some urine output. He's not hypercatabolic. You don't want the same dose that you have prescribed on day one. So what we suggested was a default zone, which will be on the day of starting, Next day, when you see the patient, you can change the prescription based on the patient's milieu, metabolic levels, and other things. So precision CRRT talks of a default dose and changing the dose or prescription every day based on the patient's need. So is there consensus on CRRT dosing? Initially, the early papers talked of 30 ml per kg per hour being the clearance, but most of us now think RRT dose and survival are linked to a level of around 20 to 25 ml per kg per hour. Beyond that, achieving a higher dose does not help the outcomes. So when you looked at the data from Ronco's unit in 2001, he talked of survival benefits above 20 ml per kg per hour, but there was no survival benefit when they moved beyond 30 ml per kg per hour. Subsequently, people had um, multi-centric data, both in sir, ATC... Sir, may I interrupt? Yeah. Sir, sir, for the benefit of the younger ones, can you explain what is meant by the dose, if you don't mind? So, so um, we discussed the prescription. We talked of the dialysate flow 1000 ml, the replacement flow 1000 ml. This is for a CVVHDF. The other types of CRRT are CVVHD, where you are not using the replacement fluid. So if you want predominantly diffusive clearance in a CRRT, you will choose CVVHD. Whereas you want convective clearance, you will choose CVVHDF along with CVVHD. So what you do is instead of giving two liters of dialysate, you will give one liter of dialysate and one liter of replacement. So when you say 2000 ml is the dose, you take a 60 kg patient, 2000 divided 60, 2000 divided by 60 will come to roughly 30 ml. So that is the dose per kg per hour in a person. So when you go on to higher and higher doses, initially people thought the outcomes are better, but these three datas, one from Ronco's unit, the ATN trial and the renal trial suggested to us, there is a minimum default dose that is necessary, which may be 20 ml per kg. But going beyond 30 ml per kg, there are no benefits to the outcomes, both short term and also long term. So what I'm trying to get across to you is, you choose a default prescription in your unit, start off the default prescription. Next day, when you go for rounds, you can change the prescription based on the patient's need for that day, what we call as now precision CRRT. So one of the things that you need to keep in mind is, as I told you, a lot of things in your prescription, including the pre-dilution, post-dilution, will affect your clearance. If you choose a predominantly giving the replacement fluid before the filter, you are diluting your solute. Therefore, the clearance also will come down. So that also affects your dose. So when you look at a dose for a CRRT, there is something called survival benefit below 20 ml. If you achieve a default of 20 to 25 ml, there is survival benefit also. Then if you go beyond 30 or 35 ml, there is no survival benefit. In fact, people found they may die more often and we will come to the discussion why. So you can have what is known as a best practice region, which could be somewhere between 25 to 30 ml per kg, which is the adequate dose for most of our patients. So why is it that you have poorer outcomes as you increase the dose? One of the things will answer what Dr. Tapesh asked about the antibiotic dosing. 
So when you have higher and higher doses, you are removing certain vital things from the patient. Could be protein, also could be the antibiotic that you are giving the patient. So when you have high flows, you will remove the antibiotic, which is life saving for the patient in the initial few days, and this can lead to poorer outcomes. So when you have a patient who has got 10 liters of effluent volume. How do you say 10 liters of effluent volume? The prescription I gave you, I talked of two liters every hour. One liter as replacement, one liter as dialysate. So when you have 10 liters in a uh, patient, you are looking at seven ml of GFR. So how do you calculate your antibiotic doses? Look at your CRRT patient, see how much of effluent volume you are giving to the patient. If you are giving two liters per hour, you are giving in five hours something like seven ml of your um, clearance. Whereas if you calculate it per day, you will know exactly what is the amount of clearance that you are giving. The loading dose is always the same like any other patient. Subsequent doses, better to look at and see how much clearance you are giving and you will have to give additional doses of these antibiotics so that you don't lose the antibiotic in the effluent and cause poorer outcomes. So with that understanding of various things, timing, access, modality, dose, anticoagulation, and also weaning from it, I just want to, in the available time, introduce the concept of extracorporeal blood purification therapies. For you and me who are in the ICUs, this is a very important concept and fortunately or unfortunately, India has a lot of experience in this now during the COVID time and subsequently. Coming November, Ronco is having a, a consensus meeting on extracorporeal blood purification therapies. I am also going to be one of the faculty there and probably you will find in print a recommendation of when to use them and how to use them very, very shortly. So there are several reasons why you should know these filters have come to exist in the ICUs because the blood purification therapy targets removing pathogens, removing endotoxins and PAMs and DAMs, you may know, removing activated leukocytes and also reducing the cytokine blood levels. And people have some data now which talks of how a particular filter helps you to improve the hemodynamics when all the other things have failed to make a difference in a particular patient. Keeping that in your mind, you should also look at when to wean. I will quickly mention that weaning is a little difficult topic without much help from literature. Most of us are comfortable weaning from CRRT or from other modalities as the urine output increases. Second is we can also look at what is known as a timed collection of urine for example, if patient's urine this 24 hours is 400 ml, next day is also 400 ml, but you see in this 400 ml, the urea and creatinine excretion, next day the urea and creatinine excretion, if the urea and creatinine excretion is increasing day on day, it will tell us that the kidney is recovering and you can wait. So this is known as timed urea and uh, timed urinary urea and creatinine clearance, compare it with the previous one or two days before and you know that the kidney is recovering. And there is some data about when to wean and other things. I will not go into those details. In the ICU, you should avoid dehydration. Similarly, you should avoid fluid overload status also. The other important thing that you should look at is your drugs. Please look at every drug that you are giving. Once there is a even early AKI, which I mentioned how to pick up, once you give a insult, another insult, your chances of recovery from AKI are much, much lesser and dialysis dependency is also much more. So when you discharge a patient of AKI, if they have had dialysis, if they have not had dialysis, they will behave a little differently. But what we know from the literature now is many of these people go on to CKD by 90 days and some of them by end of one year are back on dialysis. So understanding AKI in the emerging country cohort, little more in details is extremely important. So we have to follow up these patients. So you have to understand now AKI for seven days. Most of these patients move into a spectrum known as AKD, which goes on till 90 days. 
and by 90 days, it overlaps with the spectrum of chronic kidney disease, which tells us why we have to follow up even a single episode of AKI and how we treat these patients with CRRT or non-CRRT. I didn't go into the data. There is some data that if you have used CRRT instead of IHD, the renal recovery is better. But these are all not very strong data for us to change our practices. But I believe in our own country, we should look at intervening much earlier than we are doing right now. So if you look at CRRT per se, it has gone through a lot of evolution. Starting from 1960s to now, we have come back to a entire spectrum of doing continuous modalities for support, renal support, need not wait till there is a significant renal failure. Also, what is the indication, cytokine control versus uh, renal failure versus heart failure, or you are having only fluid overload, this will determine what type of modality that you want to use. I did mention CAVH, CAVHD, and CVVHDF, whereas you can also do certain other things like scuff when your clearance is not much, but you need only fluid to be removed from the patient. So this is what I was talking of. If your patient is having fluid overload state, the intratubular pressure will increase. And in the Bowman space, the pressure is more and your GFR can come down. So if you are not careful and the patient is in ICU, every day the patient is getting positive by two or three liters, you can cause AKI just because the patient has got a fluid overload state. And when you see patients who are having significant edema, this is one of the reasons why patients do not recover from AKI. Normally, this filtration pressure is around 14. But when, uh, when you have, that is the difference between the uh, afferent and efferent arteriole. And the filtration pressure across the glomerular barrier is 14 millimeters of mercury. But when you have a fluid overload state, as the, as the pressure inside the tubule increases, Bowman space increases, the pressure can fall to around 4 millimeters and you can have renal failure just because of a fluid overload state. So most of these patients who are on CRRT, you will have fluid overload and you should be careful. And I discussed with you the prescription, the ultra filtration has to be set as default of keep in balance and never allow your patients to become fluid positive. So the basic tenets I already discussed with you, we are looking at stage three of AKI when you dialyze irrespective of the underlying cohort. And then if you are giving uh, a question of 30 ml uh, approximately clearance per hour, in a day you may be giving close to 25 ml or so. And you have to take these calculations into picture even when you are doing your antibiotic calculation. So you will look at CRRT when you want fluid balance, solute balance, acidosis correction, electrolyte correction, nutritional support, and I mentioned renal recovery. There are proponents of continuous modalities because of this reason also. So when you look at what you are doing for your patient, you need not always wait till the urea or creatinine go up. You may want to start earlier and you want to call it renal support. When do you do renal support? It is to support other organs. Somebody may have heart failure. They don't have anuria or renal failure still. Timing will be much, much earlier. Indications are very broad compared to renal replacement where you have a specific reason like a particular level of urea or creatinine. So you may want to move more towards renal support than renal replacement to improve the outcomes in your ICU. And when you look at comparisons, when you look at a normal kidney and CRRT, CRRT can be close to what you do in your normal kidney because your ultrafiltration can go up to a particular level. You can give the fluid and take out the fluid. Therefore, you are manipulating the patient's solute to a great extent to achieve what you want to achieve. You want acidosis correction, you can do it. You want potassium to stay in the patient, you can do it. So whatever you want to achieve, you can do it by changing the prescription. And as I told you, you are not using a fixed prescription over seven days. Every day, you will look at the patient and change the prescription. When it comes to fluid removal, normal kidney and CRRT both have significant regulation that you can do. 
I mentioned to you, hourly you are giving two liters into the patient, removing two liters. That way you are able to change so much of the patient's internal milieu to achieve what you want as an outcome. The last thing that I wanted to mention, which I did quickly mention, one of the cohorts of patients wherein CRRT scores over your regular dialysis is those who have encephalopathy for any reason. It could be hepatic encephalopathy, it could be a intracranial surgery, it could be a road traffic accident. You, when you look at the osmolar changes in the blood, the osmolar changes are much, much slower in CRRT. In regular intermittent hemodialysis, the osmolar changes are much faster because of the drop in the solute and higher clearance. And thereby, the outcomes in an intracranial patient, either trauma or surgery or hepatic encephalopathy, are better. And we all prefer to use continuous modality. And this is one cohort there is consensus that you should move over to CRRT. In all the others, as I mentioned, there is no consensus when to use CRRT as mortality outcomes wise, there is no data strongly in randomized fashion to say that CRRT is better or intermittent modalities are better. So as I told you, fall in serum osmolality predicts the intracranial outcomes. Therefore, you would want to use a continuous modality in these patients. So with that, I stop. Uh, I hope I have introduced RRT in ICU under various headings. CRRT also has a role. Many of us who practice ICU RRT understand that one modality is not superior to another modality. All of them their own have their own role. Each one is complementary to the other. You saw two of our patients, they were started on one modality, they changed to another modality and then they recovered. So don't hesitate to choose a modality which is suitable and then switch from one modality to another modality. The five papers I discussed with you from ADKI Hyderabad talk about how to do these things also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Can you stop the share screen, sir? Yeah. Hi, sir. Uh, very informative. Uh, one question, sir, about dosing again. Not on RRT, but uh, in uh, API. For uh, drugs which are hydrophobic, like meropenem or beta lactams. So, uh, what kind of dose should we give for the first 24 hours? You know, the load dose will be 2 grams. Let's meropenem. So, can we give 2 gram uh, full dose QAH for the first day? In so, all, all the antibiotics, my understanding is you will do loading dose being the same. Loading dose will not change. If you are having a RRT in picture, you may have to give an additional dose depending on how much of clearance that you are achieving and whether the drug is dialyzed or not. And the volume of distribution is also important. I think you should have one full session on different, we know some antibiotics, how they are to be handled. We don't know about some of the antibiotics, how they have to be handled. But suffice to say, we do give in the first 24 hours loading dose. There is no difference, just like any other person. Once the RRT has started, we may want to calculate the amount of GFR and then sometimes supplement the dose, sometimes decrease the dose. It's okay, sir, then to give 2 gram TDS uh, for uh, this thing, uh, so I think so. Only thing is, some of the authors uh, look at. There is no consensus. People look at is it a concentration dependent antibiotic or a time dependent antibiotic for its action. So I'm aware of units where they give infusion meropenem for eight hours to achieve what they want to achieve. So I believe, as you said, there is no consensus at, in our unit. First day loading dose, we do give full and subsequently we do tweak the uh, doses. Right. Thanks. So I think uh, if there are any questions, uh, any questions from anybody, please? Or any comments, anything? So I think uh, there are no questions, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Wonderful session as usual. And uh, hope to see you again after a few months, sir. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Apesh, for the learning. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you.